for, for drinks after that. But we do want to thank HBO for giving us um, the screening of this film. And, and again, uh, many thanks to Alexandra and to Governor McGrady's uh, Jim for doing this tonight, which um, is just really fantastic. I think everyone really it. So thank you both very much. And on to Q&A. Thank you. What do you want me to ask you? <laughs> She's never this nice. We spent entirely way too much time together in the last couple weeks, so we're a little bit like a roving um, roadshow. So, Jim, why did you agree to participate in this film? She knows the answers to every question. <laughs> it's like my sense of talking to God. I mean, you know, like just have silent conversation. Um, you know what God would answer to you? No, no, I know what I would try to answer. Um, <laughs> I just was going to say, if you're God, no, no, that no, would no, be no. an No, but it's scary that right right You're going to come out as God now? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Alexander was persistent. And, um, go back. Tell go them the back. story. Tell them the story. And I'll tell the story. Okay, you, this is precious time you're wasting. Here. This is what happened. A couple years ago, I was reading about Jim in the New York Post. I don't think the microphone loud enough. Okay. So what happened was I was reading about him in the, in the New York Post, and I was fascinated by the caricature of the demon, you know, the, like the demonization of the political, like the, he fell and then he was just a great tabloid story and I was fascinated by that. Having known people that have been in tabloids before and knowing who they are in real life and then seeing them in the tabloids, it's always interesting to meet those people and talk to those people and um, sort of understand the difference between the media and real life. So I wanted to meet him, so I wrote to him and I said, I had his address because it was printed in the New York Post. <laughs> so I wrote to him and I said, I'd like to meet you. And he agreed to have lunch with me, which was great. And then he showed up with Mark O'Donnell, his partner. And I said, um, well, I'm really interested in following you and looking at the work that you do. And Mark said, absolutely not. Just get out of our life. We don't want to have anything to do with you. Please go away. And then Jim, being Jim, of course, was like, well, if you want to see what I'm doing in jail, you can come once. That was an invitation. So I went, and then I just kept going. And, um, but no, the reason why it's important to tell you that is to understand that some people question his motivations for participating in a film. If you don't like media attention, and you talk about how dangerous and toxic it is, then why would you agree to let someone follow you to the camera? Well, I have a handheld camera. I'm not, I don't have camera crews and lights and mics, and, you know. So I would go and I would hang around and then sometimes I would pull my camera out. I feel that I, the way I characterized it was I stole a movie from him. He never gave me permission. But people don't understand that because they don't understand the relationship that we had. So for example, when he invited me to his holiday party or his daughter's birthday and I pulled out the camera and started filming, he didn't know I was filming in his home. So when, um, I know like the line between stalker, paparazzi, and documentary filmmaker is very thin. And so when I, when I showed them the film in the end, what happened was I made the film and I put it into Sundance, and it got into Sundance. And then I called Jim up and I was like, great news. The story gets better. And then, you can imagine how happy Mark O'Donnell was. So Mark says, well, I want to see it. I'm not signing a release. Now remember, to get someone to participate in a film, you have to have a release, to air it on TV at least. I work for HBO, so to get it aired on TV, imagine how happy the lawyers were when they found out I never had a release from the man I had spent two years making a movie about. So, so, so I said, oh, oh, come in to HBO. We'll, we'll let you come to HBO, but we can't change it because, you know, it's been submitted to Sundance and they accept it as, you can't just change it. And they came in to watch it and Mark was not happy. But, um, but in the end, we convinced him to um, understand that the overriding theme of not letting your worst day define you and moving on with your life after it all falls apart, the, and helping other people, taking all of your shame and pain and turning it into something positive to help other people, we thought that came through in the end. And that instead of sitting home, curled up in a fetal position, uh, crying himself to sleep at night, he was doing some good. And so he, you know, that, that showed through in the end. And so then eventually, like the night before we went to Sundance, he signed the release, and here we are. 
we all looked happily ever after. We just aired on HBO this week. So, a round of applause for Alexander Bradley. Well done. What would you like to talk about? <laughs> Well, I, I think, you know, my shtick is women in prison and how egregious the American prison system is. And Alexandra has heard me say this riff. She's much more entertaining, lively, and engaging than I am. Hmm. Um, That's not true. <laughs> You're entertaining. But, but what I like, you know, we're 5% of the world's population, we're 25% of the world's incarcerated population, and 70% of the people behind bars are addicts, are clinically determined to be what they call dsm 4 they're clinically determined to be addicts. And yet only 11% of those people receive any kind of treatment. So when I see Alexandra, we actually had a vote with the women did we want to continue uh, the Alexander Pelosi Roadshow. <laughs> and um, she won the vote. But what I see is so disturbing when I see Ashley, and it still gets to me when I was sitting in the back with some lovely people um, who were telling me about their latest mishigash of New York City politics. Um, <laughs> which is glad my wife and I are going to run right back to the right side of the river. But, um, <laughs> But one of the things that's frustrating when I see Ashley, who's a bright young woman, and I see her going to spend seven years in, behind bars, um, not doing anything terribly productive, not breaking rocks, not going to school. So I say to my conservative friends, there's no acute punishment to my liberal friends, no one's getting trained, no one's getting educated, just literally a tolling of time. And what's strange is, we have some abstract notion of imprisonment in this country. If you do X, we're going to look on a chart and say, all right, X means you receive Y sentence. It's like, you know, I'm buying shoes or dress for my daughter, you wear this height, you wear this, on the European or the American size category. And that's how we determine what happens to you. And the problem becomes, for so many of the women with whom I have the privilege, the honor of working, if you look at Kohlberg and Piaget and all these moral development theorists, that children and young adults replicate the behavior that was modeled for them. So if you grew up, as Ashley did, in, in the Camden City Projects, and your mother, who was a crack prostitute, did dope and cop dope and broke into her father, Ashley's grandfather's house, who was a Camden City cop to steal money for drugs, and then you had your daughter sell drugs to pay the electric bill and herself a victim of sexual and domestic abuse. Ashley joins a gang to survive. And then at some point in time she's arrested and it was, as Alexander saw, a seven year imprisonment. And nothing's going to, I mean she's in prison right now. And nothing good is going to come from that experience. I mean, you look, read James Gilligan, you read, well, you know, he's down at NYU Medical School, Law School, he was chairman of Massachusetts Psychiatric Hospital for the criminally insane. The people in prison are only going to worsen the behaviors of those who have come into prison the first time, second time. So we have a crazy system where we take people that have copied bad behavior and we put them in an environment where they're actually going to copy even worse behavior and think that the Holy Ghost is going to descend and say, I'm in this place because I did wrong, based on this abstract notion of Judeo-Christian morality, and think they're miraculously going to get Yahweh and change their behavior. It's, it's, it's a crazy notion. And so when you look to see what's happening in Europe, particularly the Scandinavian countries and Israel, in terms of new model of rehabilitative therapy and say that behavioral modification is key, you wonder why we are engaging in a system where 66% of ex-offenders commit a new felony within three years of release and we keep doing the same damn thing year in and year out. And then the children of Ashley are six times as likely for themselves to become ex-offenders. So this is not only a stupid system, but it's a growing stupid system. And we look to, you know, people like conservatives like Chuck Colson and 
you look like people like James Webb and people like Alexander's mother, Nancy Pelosi, who, who believes that there needs to be systemic change. And I'm just frustrated that in this country, we've moved so powerfully in so many issues. The whole question of prisoners' rights, or even being smart, because 97% of the people get out. Like, why don't we ourselves want to make our system, our community safer? So that's my shit. Okay. What do you guys <laughs> want to talk about? Yes. Hi. First, I want to say I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I think it's fantastic. But what I do question is you, you touched on a little bit in the film about uh, your upbringing as a Catholic and how that confined you from being able to be the person who you are. Do you feel that there is a problem with <coughs> speaking to women that are in this very vulnerable state and reaching them with religion instead of having them reach these same goals without confining them to a religion? Great question. Um, great question. The, Victor Frankl wrote a great book, Man's Search for Meaning. He was an Austrian psychiatrist and he survived in Auschwitz. And he wrote a book um, after the show up. And Frankl said in Auschwitz, about 50% of the people had just given up on life. And 50% yearned for life. And Frankl hypothesized that the 50% who wanted to live who came down to two reasons. Love. And for him, he saw, he, did, he was not aware of the fact that his his wife had already been killed, but he saw the image of his wife's in his mind's eye every day. Poor God. And there's that great quote, I think it's called Dark Knight. Elie Wiesel talks about how in Auschwitz there was a trial. They put God on trial for abandoning the chosen. And the rabbi was the lead prosecutor. And God is convicted. And then it's the setting of the sun. And the rabbi starts evening prayers. And the point is, for me, you know, the old Benedictine priest said to me, religion is what man does to God. So religion is the cultural prism by which, for me, we understand our higher power, creation, whatever it is that life force. And for the women who've had very difficult experiences in their lives with their fellow human beings, they need somehow to transcend the lousiness of their human experience. And so God, and so what I call sacred myths become very powerful. And I don't mean myth in the sense of relegating it to fictional. I'm talking about myths in the sense of Joseph Campbell or, or Carl Jung understood myths to be at our core. And so we just came through Pesach and Easter. And the whole story of Exodus is so powerful to these women. Um, to, to, you know, the deliverance from Pharaoh's slavery, um, to the promised land. And so what we did is, this is more than you've already for, but I, I basically, we, we went through Exodus and we went through Numbers. And then I overlaid that with narratives from slaves that I, I, I took from the University of Southern Carol, South Carolina. They have these great slave narratives. Their understanding of what Exodus and, meant to them in the context of the American Civil War. And actually Lincoln as as Moses. And then we laid it over with a, a contemporary writings of women who had come from sobriety or sexual violence to their own sense of sanity and healthy sense of self. And we talked about that. So I find that spirituality, faith, gives them a, set, a profound sense of hope that frankly they don't find, in, that they have not experienced in their lives. And it, it's, it's, I mean, a sense of, I don't mean religion, I mean a sense of spirituality, a sense of the sacred. You know, a beautiful sunrise, a sense of creation, a sense of belonging, a sense of their own integrity and integral worth. And so much of the world has told them, by virtue of the uniforms they wear, by virtue of what everybody tells them, you're worth nothing. And so I tell them every day, you know, they recite, this sounds corny, I'm a precious and valuable child of God. I'm a strong, powerful, healthy, independent woman. I'm a precious and valuable child of God. To, to re-emphasize their own self-narratives is so bloody, just self-destructive. And these tapes are running constantly in, in the back of their mind's eye. And they're not even always aware of it. 
And so I try to get them to put that on the table. I'm always going to be a drug addict. I'm always going to be a felon. I'm always going to be a failure, whatever. And so part of our spiritual journey is to reconsecrate our own sense of value and sacredness. You're the boss. Uh, thank you. We've got a little tension here. This is always exciting. <laughs> yeah. all, since, um, it looks like they'll have a better question. No, uh, well, how about the lady in the back and then the gentleman in the front? Thanks. Well, I want to preface this by my name is Dr. Alta. I am a lawyer and I actually work on... Uh, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> I just hope that I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Um, I worked on some prison reform um, for a non-profit at one point. And just a comment on the religion thing. I think it's actually beautiful and helpful what you've done by kind of, you know, the Catholic Church or church in general, they kind of don't allow you to be sexually free as one would want to. And you kind of made an example of them by being like, listen, I was repressed and oppressed and now I'm using religion to help people. And I just think that that's great. But on a more... I guess, grand level, like, how do you hope or have, like, desires to take this model that you've used in these prisons and make it to, like, change institutional problems throughout, because prisons these days are like a corporation, I mean, they make oh, tilapia. Alexandra, but. you're so right. <laughs> no, and that's one of the reasons why I did the movie, and, and frankly, Alexandra's film hopefully will spur a larger discussion as to what we're doing wrong. And I've already gotten emails from different organizations, Republicans and, and Democrats, people that are involved, interested in Governor's Association to say, we need to look at this differently. It's frustrating because what happens is the imprisoned are not a political bloc. They can't get organized, they don't vote. And people who are families of imprisoned are just trying to get by, traditionally impoverished, or for middle class families. I mean, and there's a whole wave of young women coming into prison that, you know, got hooked on drugs. The addiction thing is really big for, for men and women. Um, but part of this is we are trying. I am reaching out. I've gotten more emails thanks to Alexandra's documentary than I've ever received. My good friend David Rothenberg, who founded Fortune Society, my friend John Valverde from Osborne. I mean, we've got things somewhat organized, but we need to do something nationally. Uh, James Webb, um, senator from Virginia, Democratic Virginia, had something called the Webb Commission that was going to have a complete reanalysis of the American prison system. It was blocked um, by the Republican um, majority. But this is a nonpartisan issue. So, again, we're pitching U.S. senators to try to reinstitute this on a national level. But this is why I think what Alexander has done has been so powerful. And the other thing is, crazy thing, is letters from women that I've received who were themselves in prison and, were on, and who have been on the edge, and it's so tough to get out of prison. Let me just tell you, women who are trying to get an ID card, it's like almost impossible. Because you come out and all you have is your Department of Corrections ID card. And they're like, hello, I need a driver's license. Well, give me 12 points of ID. And you're like, what? <laughs> I've been in Department of Corrections for, you know, for two years. I don't have anything. And so all of these things that... I take for granted, um, it's just so debilitating, but we're, tr we're going to be trying to push that, sir. I'm sorry. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. Um, first, Alexander, thank you for keeping up the feisty sort of point of view of a, of, of a documentary filmmaker. But, Jim, I'd like to ask you a question about, you know, a lot of people here are here because they're involved in politics, and politicians very often pretend to understand and try to, you know, present themselves in a false way to poor people or minority people or uh, as if we're all together in this. So I would like you to talk a little bit about how you brought your sense of honesty and shame into that room with those women who were filled with a sense of shame, particularly in relation to family. We know the backstory through the tabloids of your, of your situation with your family. We don't know them of the women except how we see it in, in tabloid journalism. So could you talk a little bit, because it will help a lot of us working politically, about how the integrity of the truth of experience rather than the ra-da-da-da-da -da 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 of politics moves people. 
it's a it's an astute question. Um, it's an astute question. Let me just. I don't think. I'm not necessarily going to give you the answer that you're looking for. Though. I I don't think that politics rewards that level of authenticity. So, you know, I, I said at, at one point. Um, when I was writing, that ironically being in the closet um, sharpened certain <laughs> skills that actually were advantageous for politics, insofar as there's a distance between who you are and what you project. And part of that is the culpability of those who would be elected, and part of that is the culpability of the electorate, and part of that is, you know, it's, it's all of us share in whatever it is that we produce as a democracy. But in jail, the only thing that works is authenticity. Because the pain is searing, it's edgy, it's dramatic, and it's now. So if you go into jail and you, excuse me, bullshit, I mean, it's sensed like that. And nobody has time for it. So, I mean, you're, you're in jail. Um, you're not going to be, nobody, I'm not going to tell you that this is in jail. I'm not going to tell you that you're not eating whatever you're eating, that you don't control when you go to bed, when you wake up, when you shower, anything. So authenticity is critical for the woman even to begin to hear me. And so I think my sharing with them openly, and I just said to Alexander time and time again, it's a shared journey. And what was important is our sense of equality and equanimity across the board that this shared experience, journey as we go forward we all start we all share the same journey not that we all started in the same place I always say to um, nice excuse me nice you know refined white crowds like this that a lot of these women started way so far back and so but I think we're all yearning for the same thing we're all yearning for love we're all, and it just it just frustrates me because I see like people like Ashley, people like Shawnee, that if they were my, if, if I adopted them when I, they were five, they'd be going to Barnard. <laughs> and it's just so frustrating to me because they're bright, they're intellectual ac acumen. I remember when I used to be in my last life, when I was assistant prosecutor, the smartest kids in public housing were, were entrepreneurs. They were selling drugs. <laughs> and it's just like, so what we don't do is we don't give people avenues or gateways or paths to change behavior. And that's, what, that's what's frustrating. But as to the authenticity, it has to be. I'm not heard. And Cheryl? Cheryl's gone. But thank you for asking. And that hurts. That hurts. That hurts. I mean, it's just... You know, every time I get a call about it, um, Cheryl's still alive, but every time I get a call about an OD, I just, I, I just get so sad. And every time I come home from a, or I, the other day I, I got out of court, and the judges, Hudson County is a great place. As Governor Burns says he wants to be buried there, so he stays active in Democratic politics. Um, <laughs> there's another great line now that is an awful segue. Governor Burns says, how do you tell when you're no longer governor? When you wave at people, they wave back with all five fingers. Um, <laughs> but everybody's on the same page, but the system, we all there are trying to reframe the matrix. So the matrix now, God willing, is to lower recidivism. But the problem is, traditionally, is for the warden, his or her matrix of success is to placate the population, have no breakouts, and have no riots. The prosecutor's matrix is the greatest number of prosecutions per the greatest number of caseload. The public defenders, we're not sharing the same structure, which is to be to reduce the recidivism level, to provide for treatment, to get people a job, and to sober living. So part of it is, is that, you know, when you go, even today's crazy medical system, ostensibly they want the patient to live. I mean, in the criminal justice system, it's not to get 
the offender to stop being an offender. It's so segmented. So we have to radically, and that's what I, I think the, actually the Israelis and the Scandinavians have done it best, that the matrix is shared. What percentage of that is due to some sort of addictive behavior or, or, or drug use? And, and in your efforts that you mentioned with your, your coworkers and friends and colleagues, how, where does drug policy factor into that? Is that your priority? Sure. Great question. Thanks, Melissa. And the woman for the so the woman in this program before we got there it was like about fifty five percent. Now for the woman in our program, our average is twenty two percent. So oh. the almost four to five women go out and never come back. What? And what we've done is three things. One, everybody works in jail, and everybody works when they get out. And that's the craziest thing. First time you spend six months in prison or jail, you look around, nobody's working. You're like, what is this? I mean, this is like nuts. You know, they should send in like, you know, my kindergarten teacher, Miss Jones. I mean, <laughs> it's just like it's just like crazy. Nobody's working. It's like, who came up with this crazy system? People commit bad things and then they come to prison or jail and nobody does anything. This is like a crazy system. It's surreal. So everybody works behind bars. Everybody, we almost have like a quasi-monastic community. We have something called structure. We have one woman who's in charge. She has assistants, lieutenants. One of the women you saw there in Flo, I said, Flo, she's so tough. So, like I was, I was at the end... I'm convincing Flo before she left. Flo, lighten up on some of the newcomers. I mean, you're like, you know, you know, you're not qualifying for guard position here. But, but the whole great thing is, is the notion of the woman becoming a self-governing community. So one, we have rules of behavior, rules of how we confront each other. Everybody works. Everybody has to participate in treatment, which is critically important. Then they come out, and they're in six months of communal transitional housing, which is sober housing. One of the real problems is people are released and then all of a sudden they get into a one-room apartment and they're looking at the four corners of their room and they go about crazy. And they have to process. For some of these women, they haven't been out in the world. So they don't know what a computer is. They don't know what an iPhone is. They don't know what a Prius is. Um, I still don't know any of those three. And, uh, and so they, they have to process that. So it's, it's work, it's housing, and it's also treatment. So I think treatment is, is so critical. And then to go back to the earlier stat, that 70% of the people behind bars are clinically addicted. So you have to get to the proximate cause of their criminal behavior. If you don't get to treatment, this is what happens. Typically what happens is people get out, within a month they try to stay clean, a week, and then eventually they need money. And the federal government spent, passed legislation that says if you're convicted of distributing, you won't get any general assistance, and you won't get any rental assistance. Hello. So if you can't get food to eat, and you can't get rental assistance because you distributed, and today almost everybody gets convicted of distribution. It's an easy thing for a prosecutor to do. So what happens is those people are penalized, and you're almost, you're not providing a lot of options. So what we do is we provide sober housing, and I'd like to thank um, our warden, and I'd like to thank our program is funded through the second chance of the United States Department of Justice, um, Attorney General Eric Holder. And because our numbers are so good, we just actually got authorized to 2015. We're one of two programs in the country. And then it's treatment. And I'd like to also publicly acknowledge Governor Christie in New Jersey on a bipartisan basis. Um, the state senate with um, Senator Lesniak and Senator Cunningham, uh, Sandy from Jersey City. We now have expanding drug court to get more people into treatment so diverting them from the criminal justice system. Do the resources exist to accommodate people? Well, ultimately, no, now you, now you're getting. Sorry. No, no, it's a great question. <laughs> but if you're a warden, and this is what happens, if you're a warden in Department of Corrections, this is why I never get invited back, and Alexandra gets invited back. But if you're if you're the DOC commissioner, your response is, I've got to build the buildings, I've got to hire the correction officers, I've got to keep the electric on. I don't have the money for treatment. Right? Because her or his matrix or determination of success isn't whether or not people come back. It's whether or not I keep things static. Stasis is a good thing. 
So then if you say, well, Mr. Ward and Mr. Commissioner, you ought to have treatment, she or he says, you know, I got belt, I gotta pay another X percentage for treatment, and that's not my function. That's the function of Department of Human Services. So part of this is has to be a systemic change to understand that we're all on the same page vis-a-vis -vis lowering recidivism. Our numbers are so good in the in the jail that we're actually offsetting the cost of our paycheck because we're providing treatment, intensive treatment. But we've got, you know, our little bandit of 40 women to get this, and that we're being funded by the United States Department of Justice. So to get this done on a, on a state scale or on a large prison scale would obviously require a substantial. So we're doing, we're starting to do the right things in diverting people, but we need to get treatment into the people that are already. Because remember, we're 25% of the world's incarcerated population. We're number one, Russia's number two, and Rwanda's number three. But that's that's a group you want to be. Yeah. Uh, have, have you done some work with the very institutions that are Justice, which has tried to do cost-benefit analysis of some of these issues, taking it, um, almost making less of a moral question in dollars and cents for all those people who are worried about the budget deficit, you know, rehabilitation yeah, and, right. and, and, uh, makes economic sense. Yeah. And, and it's less expensive. Yes. So, there, so then there's that question. And then uh, if you could talk a little bit about if you're comfortable doing it, you, the status of your Episcopal priesthood. Sure. Um, no, Vera does great work, and we pillage all of their stats all of the time, and, and uh, they're great. Um, in terms of my own future, in terms of ordination, I've, I've put it on the shelf, and I'm very comfortable uh, it being there, um, because I, ironically, at one point in time, I thought it would be, because so few people visit, you know, there, there aren't a lot of people coming in through behind bars, but I'm actually really comfortable, ironically, where I'm at, and I think it's good to be just Jim with just Ashley and just Flo, and it's just a healthy place right now. So, thank you. Um, two questions, unrelated. The first, as I've watched, by the way, you guys were so, have been so wonderful on your television pro, especially on Morning Joe. You were just fantastic there. But a question that kept on coming to me, and I've been discussing this with other people, is why you decided to choose women prisoners rather than the whole prison population and dealing only with the, with women? And that's my first question, and then I'll ask the second one. Okay, well, the women, I, I do do some work with men now, but I, I, will find, I find the women much easier to work with. I find, um, excuse me, I find men between the ages of 19 and 31 to, I send them to six months to, to a coal mine, and the next six months to a, to a, a sailing vessel. Um, I mean, it's, women at that age, the developmental maturity of young men lapses, I'm going to get myself into trouble. It's a, it's a privilege to work with the women. I mean, <laughs> I'm leaving there. I mean, the young guys, I, mean, I say this to the guys, to, to, the, to their faces. It's just, it's just like, it's incredible. I know everything, but like, you're, you're sitting in the jail. Um, but in any event, um, the women are very different. I mean, part, part of it is children. I mean, they're being relational. Um, and the other part, and I think Alexander, men in prison, almost, and jail, have to be very much, or are, not have to be, are very much concerned as to what their peers think. And they become very, my sense, and I'm not a, I, this is totally ignorance being extrapolated. My sense is they're very wrapped up in identity politics. I belong to this group, I belong to that group, I'm affiliated with the Latin Kings, I'm affiliated with the Crips, I'm affiliated with the Bloods, I am a, I am belong to this racial group, I belong to this religious group, I belong to, and so po identity politics plays a big part of it. Women are not there because I think, especially women with children, 
I, I think they're in a very different place. Now, it may change, but from what I make up now, they are in a profoundly different place. So they're open. Guys will be open to you one-to-one, -one, but in a group, it's, I'm more concerned with what you think and hear me say than I am concerned about what I say. There's a great quote in AA. What you think of me is none of my business. <laughs> um, and that the women ascribe to, because the women want to heal. The women want to be on this path to recovery and sobriety. And I find many of the young men to be more concerned as to the what the guy across the hall across thinks of me. My other question is about mental illness. Because yes. oh. so many, so many people, but oh. especially younger people, are thrown into jail rather than yes. being treated for who are obviously mentally ill. Yes. Part of the dumping of uh, mental hospitals, etc. And I just wondered if you could speak to that issue for and what if anything can be done at least when they thrown into jail, getting some kind of treatment, some yeah, kind yeah. of therapy. It's, it's hard. I mean, jails and prisons aren't places for mental health, but they have become as a, as a last resort. And so we, we really need to do that better. I mean, because police, to be fair, have no place to, to place anybody. So what happens? They commit a crime, and you go before a judge, and you subsequently move for an indictment, and it's... it's Crazy. Um, so I, I, I'm frustrated because I see women that are mentally ill, and the prison system, <coughs> you know, the population is burgeoning, and it's it's not designed for that. So we we need to be now now you see the advent of mental health courts. I'm getting the hook. No, 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 we're not. Um, I mean, the advent of mental health courts, but we need to we need to do better. And the purposes of prisons and jails is not to administer mental health. And I think it speaks for itself. We need to provide avenues and venues and courts. This poor gentleman from her case. Governor, uh, Jim, by the way. You were a politician, which generally means that you found something in your inner character that helped you to absorb and deflect hostility and criticism. It's part of the job. Going back to your early years, when you were reluctant to acknowledge publicly who you were. What was the cause of that? What, was that character not in there? Was it your religious upbringing? What was it that kept you from saying, this is who I am, accept it? And, and I ask this question as someone who was an acknowledged atheist as far back as middle school, in very conservative communities, and it didn't bother me to say, this is who I am. Well, I grew up in a wonderfully, um, very traditional household. I mean, grew up in middle class New Jersey, so it was just it was sort of, it was, it was, you know, Andy Griffin, Mayberry, and um, it was, it was really a unique time in America. I mean, in terms of, the, the, I was born in the late 50s and the 60s, it was just like families after World War II, and it was it was a wonderful community. There probably were gay people. There weren't certainly any that were out gay people. So I think for men in my generation, growing up, the only people that I saw that I recognized was like, you know, Paul Lynn from Hollywood Square. <laughs> um, <laughs> as good as my Paul Lynn. But I mean, it's just, it was just, and, and then, you know, you, I, I remember, let me just say, part of, I believe narratives are really important. And that's why I'm acutely aware of the narratives with my own children or narratives with the women. So when you grow up, you know, whether it's a religious narrative, whether it's the book of Exodus, whether it's a narrative about the potato famine, the great Irish famine, whatever it is, if you're African American, if you're Italian American, Jewish American, there are all sorts of narratives. And your, your family says that. It was Uncle so and so, it was Aunt so and so. When you're gay, each young person, each girl, each boy, figures that out typically, well, at least for my generation, by themselves. 
So it becomes somewhat disoriented. So I'm six or seven years old, and I'm on the first grade playground, and I'm like, I'm just not wired like these other guys. I don't know why. And then all of a sudden, it becomes six, seven, eight, and then you're like, that Playboy book isn't as attractive to me as it is to Johnny. And why? And then you begin to recognize more and more that you're wired differently. And for me, what did I do? I, you know, I, I went to my public library. I started, and then I was afraid to be caught looking at the word homosexuality. And you saw psychiatric illness, and I, you know, this whole like, blah, blah, blah. And it was just like, well, I don't want to own that. And then I would read what the church said, you know, abomination, eternal fires. This isn't looking very good. <laughs> and so, you know, this, I don't want to necessarily own this. And then I, in sort of my own mind's eye, I, you know, began to say, well, maybe this is something that I have to overcome. And then that's the decision I made as an eight or nine year old, thinking that that was the right decision to make. That was the morally correct decision. And it wasn't. It was a very unhealthy decision. But it was, I think, what I ought to have done. But let me just back up. When I speak to young people, I was with this woman, uh, young woman. Um, my friend Kevin Jennings had me talk when he was president of Glisten. And this young woman told me how, you know, she came out, she got kicked down a flight of stairs, guys grabbed their crotches, made threatening, abusive remarks to her. Principal didn't back her up. Teacher didn't back her up. You know, she was out there on her own. So coming out, obviously I wouldn't wait till I was my age. But coming out, it's a great thing to say coming out is beautiful and transcendent, and for me it was. It's another thing if you're a young girl, 16 years old, in the middle of Idaho, and you look around and there's nobody behind you. So that's why, you know, I think the public is way in front of the elites, but it does make a difference if the Supreme Court of the United States says, you know, dogma is rubbish, and it does make a big difference if the Supreme Court of the United States or the President says gay marriage, because it provides some level of, a, you know, of an imprimatur on the law. And so I think those, those federal sanctioning is, is important. I think we've got one more question. You decide. You're standing up. <laughs> Would you care to address uh, the popularity of your of, uh, Governor Christie, who seems to be more popular than any recent governor? Sure. I, you know, Chris is, I get myself in trouble with Democrats when I say this. Chris, you know, Chris is who Chris is. You know, it's when he, when he blasted John Boehner for the political maneuverings, Cantor, and the whole, you know, on, on the Sandy boat. I mean, I looked at the, the front page, I looked at the front page of the Times, and like, I winced. I mean, I remember voting for the Florio tax increase for the sales tax, and I remember my friend George Fedoro said, we were raising the tax on toilet tissue, and George said, you know, Jim, there's a reason why this wasn't done before. And I'm like, okay. you know, I think Chris has a candor and directness that people find unvarnished and refreshing. Now, this is, comes from a state, you know, in Newark Airport there's a t-shirt that says, New Jersey line, only the strong survive. So, um, but I think he has that level of candor, and that's what people find refreshing, because so much to the early gentleman's question, so much of politics is about being scripted. And Chris goes, and I, I mean, look at I, you know, I, 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 I'll admit publicly, I have friends who are Republicans. Um, <laughs> and, and it, you know, and I have people that work for the governor, and they're like, oh, you know, he went off message, but like Chris doesn't give a darn. So, I mean, it's just, that's his, and, and in part, that's become part of his message. So I think it's, um, I think that's what, I think that's part of what people find to be the lack of shellac, the lack of varnish, is what people As a Democrat, yeah. <laughs> Jim was on Bill Maher last week, and I work for the Bill Maher Show, I'm a correspondent, I do little pieces for Bill Maher, and so since Jim was on, I did a little piece, just two minutes, I went to New Jersey for an afternoon, 
Jim told me where to go, just right near his house, just to make the point that this is the classic, you know, my take on Chris Christie. Chris Christie is the classic politician who says, we hate government, we don't need government, we don't want government. 